Hello dear friends, here we are live. This is 30 days of inner journey, thought, your thought is your life. And this is uh, an exception because we have not recorded today, attending some requests that we made it all live <clears throat> and also because our dear Carlos wasn't able to record it for a day because of business issues, business engagements. So here we are. This is from the book Thought and Life by Emmanuel through Chico Xavier. This book was written and published 1958. Through the hands of Chico Xavier, the spirit author Emmanuel kindly, very kindly shares with us a book that is actually used in the schools of regeneration in the spiritual realm to help those who are about to reincarnate. Yes, believe it or not. So here we have a book that I have in front of me. It was published in 2012 in English by the efforts of Roundtable Publisher in uh, the United Kingdom. So we're very grateful for the kind Elsa Rossi who allowed us to read the book and discuss it here in uh, at Kardec Radio and anywhere and Kardec Radio, the audio or the live Facebook as well. So we'd like to share with you that this book is going to be uh, is now at the copyright of the British Union of Spiritist Societies. And if you are in the United States, in Canada, the Spiritist Group of New York, sgny.org, has some copies uh, for sale in their website. Uh, if you are in Europe or other parts of the world, we would recommend that you contact Elsa Rossi at uh, the British Union of Spiritist Society's website. Okay? Ready? Yeah. Chapter 1 was about the... What was it about? Chapter 1 was about the mirror of life. Then we found out through Emmanuel that this book teaches us that our mind is like the mirror of our lives. What we think reflects in our minds and we're gonna connect with other minds and through those connections we're gonna make other connections. The chapter number two is about our will. Then we've got to know that will is first and foremost uh, the, the cabinet of the supervision and the administration of every other department in our minds. It's quite surprising because when people say where there is a will, there is a way, now Emmanuel would kind of say the same. Where there is a will, there is a way. Mm -hmm. So, as we said before, if we don't want something to happen, we first have to work on ourselves. Or if we want to do something, we need to work on our the efforts that come from within. But we're not alone. We're not alone. Hello, Melissa and Angelita. Chapter 3 is about cooperation. Quite interesting. This book has 30 chapters in an introduction. This chapter 3 talks about cooperation. So besides the knowledge of the importance of awareness and the importance of our will, to give direction to our minds, we need cooperation. So what is it? Let us read it through. This book is very concentrated, so each and every sentence is, as Carlos said, very intense. In, as he said, the chapters are short, but they are very, very intense. So let us try to read it. I'll read it through, and we're going to discuss cooperation. In order for someone to successfully and efficiently administer an important organization, it is not enough 
to have been nominated for the position. Okay. A combination of many excellent qualities is needed in order for an enterprise to consolidate and prosper. To administer requires not only authority, but also guidance and prosper. To administer requires not only authority, but also guidance and discernment. Not only are theory and culture needed, but virtue and clear judgment as well as a sense of proportion. Ample resources placed at the service of a disoriented direction resemble a ship without a destination. An administrator must irradiate forces of justice and goodness, work and discipline in order to reach the objectives of the position he holds. When authority is abused, the people suffer from lack of tranquility and disturbance. If intelligence lacks the guidance of good character, then misery and cruelty will result. That is why we find so many tyrants who possess great intellects and geniuses of profound sensitivity steeped in vice. In our innermost world, our will is at the captain is as the captain who cannot afford to neglect his duties. Eloa Dilson. In our innermost world, our will is as the captain who cannot afford to neglect his duties. Just as an administrator needs to help the help of good and honest co-workers, likewise, the will cannot do without ponderation and logic, as respected counselors in decision-making processes. However, it is essential that a sense of cooperation be called upon to sustain our impulses. Following the lines of terrestrial activity, the one who gives secure orientation does not ignore the natural hierarchy that exists in the coexistence with all indispensable values of life. Let us take, for example, the confectioning of a common sweater. The thread will count on the collaboration of the machine. The machine will expect the competence of the operator. The operator will receive support from the technician who supervises the work. The technician will then count on the director of the factory who will in turn rely on the movement of the industry from which he will extract the necessary economic resources in order to be able to feed the work unit which obeys his orders. In this way, we observe that in order to function properly without any breakdown of harmony, the will in its individual state needs to make use of cooperation in order to clarify its activity. Spontaneous cooperation is the supreme ingredient of order. From divine glory to subatomic particles, the universe may be defined as a connecting chain of lives that interweave with the greater life. Cooperation means constructive collaboration in order to be able to face challenges and wholehearted help so as to put deprivation behind us. He who helps others will help himself and will silently find that this is the most secure formula for readjustment in the evolutionary process. Hello, sunshine. So this is the chapter. Ooh, ooh la la. <laughs> and we wonder. He wrote so much about so many things to talk about cooperation. But let's first to calibrate our understanding and break this down at greater levels. 
Hello, Rudy. The purpose of this book in the spiritual realm, the schools of regeneration, is to prepare us to reincarnate and succeed more easily. Of course, there is free will at play. But it's like in the school of regeneration, we prepare ourselves to understand how to navigate the life or the sea of a reincarnation. Very, very challenging. On the earth, it's very challenging. And as we mentioned before in other series of studies, the spirits say that there is more concerned when somebody is going to reincarnate than when somebody is discarnating. But when we're here, we think otherwise. We are super joyful when a baby is born. Almost like in the La La Land of Disneyland. <laughs> Think everything so rosy, so cute. And it's supposed to be so we don't drop the ball. Because it's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of work. Not only physically, but emotionally, spiritually. And it's risky. But when we discarnate, then it's as if we are wrapping up a chapter. A chapter. We are wrapping up a year. So, of course, there are deaths and deaths. And reading the Heaven and Hell book by Allan Kardec, we get to know more about the death each one may have is dependent on the life we have led. It depends on the life we lived. Many people are concerned about how they're going to die. Kardec in the book Heaven and Hell clarifies to us that according to the studies that he's done through the mediums of the time with the superior spirits that came through them, these will totally depend on the life we led. If we're too attached Let's not forget, it, death is going to be hard. Not because of the pain itself, but because it's going to, our conscience is going to clearly sound an alarm system inside of us. And I'm giving an analogy just so we know that we have this inner conscience. But if, on the contrary, we constantly refine ourselves. It's more about the intention, the effort. Look at Paul of Tarsus. Look at Paul of Tarsus. He always led a life th thinking of being loyal to the law of God. He made a huge mistake. He deviated. But he deviated thinking in his illusions of the ego that he was going to the right direction till he found out with the discordant feelings and the conflicts that he was feeling that it was wrong. That he was supposed to cooperate, constructively collaborate instead of otherwise. He felt, as Emmanuel is saying in this chapter, the deprivation of love, of friendship, of everything. Because he was not cooperating. Once he found out he needed to cooperate, in this constructive collaboration, he opened himself up. But let's go back to the beginning of the chapter, and then we're going to do some therapeutic quizzes here along the way. So here we have, okay, he begins by talking about administration. This book is about how we're going to administer our reincarnation. It's about guidelines on how to succeed in managing our lives in this reincarnation. Hello, Laura. So it's very important because he begins this Chapter 3, Cooperation, with the very, very reference, administration, of an important organization. Who is this important organization? You, your mind, my mind, myself, right? So he's saying, 
In order to do so, it's not enough to have been nominated for the position, meaning it's not enough to be here reincarnated, to have done, to have it all done and succeed in a reincarnatory plan. For those who are not familiar with the Spiritist teachings, we've come to know through the Spiritist science that we, before we reincarnate, we have a minimal plan, major, let's say this, uh, milestones for the soul. Like when a child is growing, they go from phases to phases and there are milestones to be achieved. The same for us as spirits. Each reincarnation, we have milestones to be achieved. And if we don't, we're going to delay the progress of ourselves and we have to redress in another reincarnation. But it's not going to be easy. So he begins this chapter by saying, it's not enough to reincarnate. We need a combination of many excellent qualities. What are they? Not only authority, but guidance and, and, uh, guidance and discernment. Guidance and discernment. When he says authority, it's all about the formation of the personality, of not doubting yourself, you know, because Jesus kindly summarized the major commandments of life by saying, love God above all things, love the neighbor as yourself, and he meant that self-love is the foundation also for us of this temporary ego that is important as long as it doesn't dominate. So that's why we need guidance and discernment. In the Spirit Book, Part 3, Allan Kardec discloses educationally the laws of life that shall guide us. And there is a moment in the introduction of it all. He asks, if the laws of God are written in our conscience, this is question and answer 621, why do we need people to remind us? Why do we need people to write about it, etc.? Or prophets, wise people that come ahead of us to show us the pathway? And they answered, because most often than not, we prefer to put it aside, we disregard, we don't, we are, we simply, it's like when you open a computer, you minimize the screen. Say, I don't want to pay attention to this. And without guidance, we fail. That's why we need guidance. And we need discernment. We need discernment. Interesting enough, our dear Humberto de Campos, uh, reporting to us of a meeting in the spiritual realm, and you can read this in the book, it's chapter 30, in the book Among Brothers of Other Lands, through Chico Xavier and Valdo Vieira, we've got to know that spiritism is the light of discernment. It is. But the sp spiritism, not the name, the ideas that are universal and can be found anywhere in this world. It wouldn't be loving and just to think and to be sure that this would be only for a few. The ideas are spread out through philosophies, religious pathways, etc. And they give us guidance and discernment. And he says, Ample resources placed at the service of a disoriented direct direction resemble a ship without a destination. How many people on the earth are living like ships without destinations? On New Year's Eve, I remember once when we were getting together for New Year's Eve at the Center in Spiritual Society of Baltimore, and this man, who now is discarnated, God bless his heart, he was from Mexico, and he came and said, Vanessa, can you believe it? 
This is the first time since my young adult days that I go through New Year's Eve without a single drop of alcohol. And his wife at the time and I, we're truly moved because we never imagined the importance of these community gatherings to get us out of these persistent negative habits that take us to disorientation, that leave us astray. How many people in this world nowadays are ships without destinations? Because there is no guidance, no discernment, no awareness of how to administer this life, right? Yes, it's knowing, Rita de Cassia. Let us know, let us know, let us know. Ooh, it's so peaceful. Yeah, hopefully inside of us too. In spite of the challenges, we all face challenges and that's life. A very dear friend of mine was telling me the other day, oh, Vanessa, I wish life were easier. I said, you know, as Mr. Joseph often tells me, that's a wish we should never make. Because on the earth, as far as we know, things are not supposed to be easy. <laughs> They're not supposed to be easy. So let's not elude ourselves. That's a wish we don't need to put in our list. Easy life on earth doesn't happen. <laughs> True. So life's going to be easier now because it's not in our wish list. <laughs> yeah, blessed Atlena, Rita de Cassia, so many good friends there, right? Now, he's talking about the administration of ourselves in a reincarnation. An administrator must radiate forces, forces of justice and goodness, work and discipline in order to reach the objectives of the position he holds. Mm. So he's telling us that to succeed, we need to work on justice and goodness and work and discipline, all divine, all divine directions. Because when we read in the first part of the Spirit's book, the attributes of God, just and good and orderly and omnipotent work discipline inevitably for us in order to succeed we need to mirror the mind of the creator isn't that the end of chapter one in this book exactly so i'm never going to be lost again when i look at the qualities the attributes of god we we strive to be in synchronicity of course, we are far. On Wednesday, at the Spiritist Society of Virginia, we were discussing one chapter of the book, Jesus in the Home. And Mentor Joseph was sharing with us an analogy that he got inspired in the studies he did in the Spirit's book. And he says, the, the distance between our understanding of God and the superior spirits is like a little ant walking in our house trying to understand us. I'm not going to say it's impossible because we don't understand the whole nine yards of life, but it's far. The distance is huge. Let's stop for a moment. Therapeutic quiz. Yay! Zero to ten, blinking. Zero to ten, zero to ten. Let us verify it's 30 days of inner journey. This book is beautiful, but if we don't take it personal and chew it so it nourishes us, it's going nowhere. So, where are we? Where are we in regards to inspiring us in God's attributes? Yes, we are co-creators. So, we co-create in synchronicity with the Creator. So, if the Creator is just, 
we need to strive to be just. And what is to be just? Law of justice, love and charity. It says there in the Spirit's book, to be just is to respect people's rights, everyone's rights. Ooh, we're far, very far. On the earth, I mean. Goodness, that alignment in constant goodness. What is the opposite of goodness? Evil. What is it? It's to be more ignorant and in a way we are not experienced enough. So what do we need to do? Humble ourselves up and keep working to refine, shape up this diamond as Emmanuel says in chapter 2. The pure spirits are like this, their minds are like this shining diamond because they become the prisms of God's mind. Fantastic. So where do you think you are regarding your aiming at God's attributes? Not that we want to be God, God, because that's impossible, but we want to be inspired, emulating those qualities like Jesus taught us. Where are you? Have you ever thought about this? Zero to ten. You think you're too far from it? From actually contemplating these attributes of God and how you need to achieve higher levels to actually inspire yourself in these beautiful virtues or 10 I'm already there we need to think about this because when we talk about cooperation the greatest cooperation of all is to be a co-creator at major level says Andrea Lewis in the book Evolution into Worlds yet to be published in English does it make sense? we think so, right? so let's go on He's coming. It's becoming warmer and warmer. We're getting to the core of what cooperation is and how it can help us administer our new personality in a reincarnation and put some direction to this, to the sailing of the ship in this reincarnation, right? And he says, when authority is abused, People suffer from lack of tranquility and disturbance. Mm -hmm. When there's too much ego inside of us, the people, let's not think the external, not only the relationships in ourselves, but the relationship we have with our own selves, we lack tranquility. No wonder people need to drink and use drugs and be constantly tuned to everything no time to rest disturbances of the mind because we are abusing our own opportunity of being here taking too much emphasis putting too much emphasis in a temporary personality because when he's talking it about here, it's not only about the collective. It begins with the individual. And he says, if intelligence lacks the guidance of good character, then misery and cruelty will result. In a way, you can also tell here, in the collectivity, when you look at the news, Emmanuel describes in this one sentence, Precisely what happens to the world, and this was 1958, but it's so up to date because this is the law of life. Abusing intelligence, and if it lacks guidance of good character, then misery and cruelty. Look at the world, and wherever there is lack of good character, we see misery and cruelty around. That is why he says we find so many tyrants who possess great intellects and geniuses of profound sensitivity steeped in vice. Now he's explaining the individual to the collective. 
and the impact each one of us has to the collective. It's impossible if you, second therapeutic quiz, okay? If you think that because you are not like a celebrity to the world, that you are of less importance, that your actions have less impact, this book is telling us that no matter how big you think you are, you are unique. And in your role, you're the only one. And if you fail at fulfilling your part, your impact on the collective is as great as somebody else who apparently has greater influential status on our society. Mm -hmm. It's proportional. So we can't say, yeah, if I make a mistake, if you make a mistake, it's like that guy who committed suicide. And now his whole family is going through his children, his sister, his wife. Everybody is living day in, day out, trying to compute where did I contribute on this? Where did I contribute on this? The mark, the imprint of guilt. And you think this is of less impact than somebody who is big? It's just proportional, my friends. It's proportional. It's because of these individual decisions that we have this collective scenario. Hello, Guilherme. Let's go on. He says, now he's going to begin getting back to the essence of the message. He's stretching it, and now he's funneling to the essential elements. He's saying, in our innermost world, our will is as the captain who cannot afford to neglect his duties. Ah, why is he saying duties? Remember administration? That's how he begins the chapter. He's talking about the administration, not only of a collective organization, but the individual who is reincarnating. And he's saying, our will is the captain of this ship, of the new reincarnation. And will is here to make sure that we fulfill what we have to do in this life. Another therapeutic quiz. How much do you feel the major themes in your reincarnatory plan? And I'm asking you, because I'm asking myself too. Let us ask ourselves, where are we? What is this life all about? What are we supposed to do in this life? What are the virtues that we're supposed to acquire? Don't think that you're here to buy a house and then this and the other. It's about the inner, and that's why he's saying, in our innermost world, the duties within, the immortal duties, the duties of the spirit. Mm -hmm. He's not simply talking about going to work, fulfilling your daily duties at home, etc. No, he's talking about the spiritual, the everlasting, the milestones of the spirit. What do you think are possibly the milestones of your soul in this reincarnation? To be achieved, what are they? You want an example? Okay, we'll give an example. This boy is the son of a very poor woman and he doesn't have arms, he doesn't see, he's blind, he's deaf, deaf, he's mute. His mom is desperate, you know the story. Comes to Chico Xavier and says, please, the doctors are just telling me they're gonna amputate his legs. Why is this happening? What's going through? Of course, there are many versions to the story, we're not gonna dispute the version, but we want to share the point here. The reincarnatory milestones to be achieved for that soul. 
It could be us. So Emmanuel kindly explains to Chico, you know, he has committed suicide for 10 lives in a row. And he's thinking of doing the same in this life. He's thinking now of throwing himself off a cliff. So that's why out of God's mercy, the good spirits found a way, found a way to break this cycle that he's amputated in the legs so he doesn't do it again and achieves a major milestone in his reincarnation, which is not to commit suicide, to respect life, to stop the cycle of quitting life short. You see, here we are. The opportunity for us to really understand and to know that we cannot, we cannot go on in this life without knowing the major milestones in a reincarnation. What are your major milestones of the soul to be achieved in this life? But yes, I don't know. In the Gospel according to Spiritism, we got to know through St. Augustine that it's about studying ourselves, observing ourselves. We need to observe ourselves to have a measure of things we need to overcome. And now, do it differently. We can't excuse ourselves from the law of progress. We're destined to progress, right? How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? Okay. Now, he continues by saying, just as an administrator needs the help of good and honest co-workers, likewise, the will cannot do without ponderation and logic as respected counselors in decision-making processes. So, now he's getting to the very topic of cooperation, saying, first and foremost, we need to ponder and to use our reasoning. No wonder the unshakable faith is the one that uses the reasoning to process the feeling of faith. Reasoning and feelings together. He's saying ponder. We need to learn how to ponder. How do we do it? How do we do it if we don't know how to make silence within ourselves? We need to learn how to make inner silence. Inner silence. In the first, the introduction of this book, we referred to the amazing book written by Thich Nhat Hanh, Silence. The importance of learning how to quiet the mind. Not quieting the mind in the sense of shutting it down, but stopping these thoughts that are recurrent, the exchange, this disorientation of the ship of the mind. Here, he is saying that to have good and wise decision making, we really need to use ponderation and logic together with our will. Meaning, less impulsivity. Impulsivity is very destructive. In a way, it can be preserving when we are in danger. But when he talks about the factoring of our psychological aspects, then we learn that impulsivity can be very destructive. Out of ego, I say, no, I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and I don't care what people think. And then, you know, people talk nowadays, I read in the New York Times, and we're not saying this to bash anybody, but as a reference, in, in two hours and a half, uh, the president-elect was tweeting, I think probably like eight times or more, about major issues. But you know, when we look at him, 
we think he is insane, but aren't we as well? Aren't we as well? When we also, we don't tweet probably on Twitter, but in our daily lives, people say stuff and we're snapping, tweeting. Mm -hmm. And we, people challenge us and we're like, okay, oh really? You think that about me? Okay, thank you, I'm not. It's just like a little kid. And we snap and tweet. And I say this, the analogy, taking the, 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 the habit that we have of the social media nowadays. And he says, to really work, have good and honest co cooperators, we need ponderation and logic to work with our will. It's not enough to have our will if we don't ponder and use our reasoning, the logics. How often do we do this? Often we decide to do things that are comfortable for us, right? Hello, Tanya. Yeah, but that's not good because keeping ourselves in the comfort zone is not going to take us to progress very fast. Mm -hmm. So here we have, it is essential that a sense of cooperation be called upon to sustain our impulses. You see? To sustain in the sense of like good impulses, sense of cooperation, following the lines of terrestrial activity, the one who guides secure orientation does not ignore the natural hierarchy that exists. So now he talks about this analogy about the sweater, the machine, and how everybody's having a role, and at the end of the day, everybody's important. <clears throat> now, don't worry, Tanya. You know, we're together. Thank you for being here. It's that community feeling. That's cooperation feeling. It feels good. So here we have uh, this last third of this amazing chapter. So much wisdom concentrated so much in a page and a half. <clears throat> Emmanuel then comes to us and says, in this way we observe that in order to function properly without any breakdown of harmony, will need to make use of cooperation in order to clarify its activity. It's impossible to progress by ourselves. Oh, but Vanessa, the world said, you know, the world is divine. The people in the world are divine. And if we think we are dismissed from this healthy contact with the world because people don't know better, then we're not going to progress too much. Because by being on our own and by ourselves, we're not going to progress. So he says, our will needs cooperation. So it's not enough. You know, when we're too young, we tend to think like, you don't need to go to the teenage years. I have this wonderful experience. And you know, if you're a mom or a dad, you know better than me or you take care of children. When they are in their toddler years, they are supposed to find that they have a will so they can find their way. And many parents repress saying, no, 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 you can't, you can't decide anything. No, 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 they're supposed to. That's where we learn. But we need to teach them how to manage their will and say, wait, look at the consequences. Action and reaction. Like in the Montessori method, I learned with Miss Carmen Arenas. She said, in the Montessori method, we have this beautiful dialogue with the child. When they are doing something that is off, we say, what you're doing is making me feel this way. And I wish that you could consider this or that way so we could all feel better. So the Montessori method, Maria Montessori, so wise, teaching us how to teach our children about the law of action and reaction. Cause and effect, whatever we do has consequences. We need to learn it from the get-go. So when we are in our teenage years, we already have that school. And when we are in adulthood, we already know that 
Our will is powerful, but it's only going to be make us feel harmony when we work in collaboration, when we cooperate. Mm -hmm. Rita de Casa is sharing with us, we have to be learning more and more how we can be better to ourselves and to each other through the problems to believe that we can transform our inner if we love and be persistent with that love. It's not easy, that's why we're here learning together. Right, right, Rita. We're learning with the wise spirits who brought it to us. They are saying, have your will is good, but not alone. And he says, now be prepared because this is the most beautiful part. Most beautiful part. Spontaneous cooperation is the supreme ingredient of order. This is phenomenal. Spontaneous collaboration, cooperation. This is interesting. Let's stop for a second. He's saying cooperation. But what is cooperation? He's going to tell us. Means cooperation. And he writes co slash operation. What is cooperation? It's not about you doing what you want with others. Many people say, Vanessa, you know, I help everybody and I feel overwhelmed and I don't get it. I say, you know, Mentor Joseph clarified to me the other day. He said, when we really cooperate, we don't drain ourselves because in the process we are aligned, we are harmonious. We may be physically tired, but inside we're not overwhelmed. We're not disoriented. When we are really cooperating with others, it's just an illusion of the ego. Because many people help like this, you know. Forgive me for referring constantly to this experience with a child, but it's a learning experience for us as a, as mortal spirits. Because sometimes we're just like toddlers. I ask Virginia, Virginia, you want to help me cook this? And she says, yes. So the other day we were making Brazilian cheese bread, you know, the cheese balls. And I say, okay, so we're mixing and we're doing everything. Then we got the dough ready and now it's about to make the balls. And I give some dough for her and she starts making different shapes. And she started having fun, and I let her do it. But I say, Virginia, didn't you say you're going to help? <laughs> Mom, I'm helping, but I'm, I'm doing something different. I said, okay, that's valid. Okay, that's okay. But remember, I need to make them round. Ah, uh, but you know I want to do them like this. And I say, okay. But that's how we are in this world. People ask us, can you help? And we go help, but we help the way we think, like toddlers. I'm going to help the way I think is help, and not the way the other ones. But the word in itself, my friends, cooperation means to operate with the other. Not the way I think it is, but the way the other needs. And this other meaning God too, and mainly. It's asking, God, how can I cooperate here? And he's going to say, go there at 11 p.m. and do the live transmission. I'm just saying figuratively speaking. But, you know, I want to sleep. But, you know, I could do this and the other. Well... You asked me how, I said how, but it's up to you. Free will, free will. But without ponderation and logic, we're not going to work with our will correctly. And then I ponder, well, it makes sense. And then I make a decision. That's exactly what he's saying. I need to ponder and give less and less room to impulsivity. You want a quiz? I can hear it. Vanessa, we want a quiz. Let's say hello to Osvaldo, who is here. Hello, friend. So, do you think you're good at cooperation? 
in this life where are you today this is january 6 we celebrate the visit of the three wise men right after jesus birth yes and wisdom is coming through this book right but let us think about this cooperation you learning we learning how to operate with others we're not the center stage it's like co-creator the creator i am the co-creator so it's not like i have here play-doh okay it's all mixed up but as i did it on purpose i have a little bit of play-doh and then this is like this somebody gave it to me i'm not the creator okay play-doh is the creator <laughs> and then i have a little bit here what am i gonna do with this okay i'm co-creating but i didn't create the dough i did a round shape of it a smiley face yay look okay maybe yay smiley face okay there you go smiling yay but i didn't create it i co-created when i cooperate I'm operating with the person, with others, with God. That's how I become humble. Cooperation, he says, from the divine glory to subatomic particles, the universe may be defined as a connecting chain of lives. They're interweave with the greater life. Cooperation means constructive collaboration in order to be able to face challenges and wholehearted help so as to put deprivation behind us amen you know, this is too much wisdom for us no it's not too much we need it we're ready for it it we are ready we can do it obama's term is coming down but we never forget the lesson we can yes we can and here we can cooperation means constructive collaboration so now we question, does it mean that there is a form of destructive collaboration? Oh, yes. Look at the forces of darkness. They collaborate, but in a destructive way. That's not cooperation. Interesting, huh? So they are not really cooperating in the sense Emmanuel is giving to us. He's saying cooperation means constructive collaboration. Now let us go back to the fact that our thought is the mirror of life and our thoughts are emitted, electromagnetic thoughts. Andrea Luis even uses this term, mental darts, thoughts as mental darts that we throw. And mental reflexes are gonna have like the mirror we're going to see the reflex because we're going to connect currents of thoughts that can either be constructive or destructive. When we cooperate, we're entering this synchronicity with everybody in the universe who is constructively working with the Creator. Amazing. Never alone never ever look at us here physically we're in different locations but we are together in this non-local facebook experience as if we are here together unbelievable according to the spirits we are where our thoughts are we are together now no matter if our physical bodies are in different locations what a what a a beautiful beautiful inspiration for all of us this day thank you tanya for sharing the names of the three wise men balthazar gaspar and melchior thank you and sunshine is like, what term would you use for the dark forces cooperating well they have this destructive collaboration amongst themselves they are collaborating with each other, but they are collaborating to a destructive direction, right? Make sense? 
Mm -hmm. And they are very organized. Very, very, very organized. You know, because the good spirits, they are so busy. And the other ones are also busy or idle, but they are constantly trying to break down the light from actually expanding. And who knows if we were there in the past, hopefully not any longer. But we learned that to be in alignment with cooperation, to find harmony. Remember what he said. Our will to find harmony and never break it down, we need to make use of cooperation. Will and cooperation together. So to face challenges, we cannot do it alone. No wonder this very critical year, Mentor Joseph asked us, he said, we need to do these studies together every day, probably for the rest of the year. We don't know. Because we need to sustain ourselves, one another, in this constructive collaboration. To raise ourselves above this disorientation. People don't know. So we need to stay strong and be multipliers. Multiply in our daily lives by opening our hearts, working on our will. No wonder we say time, effort, and repetition. And we learn, we progress. To put deprivation behind us. What is this deprivation? Is about lack of love, lack of hope, Lack of everything. So when where we see lack, there is no cooperation. In the book Paul and Stephen, Paul of Tarsus has a quote, a statement regarding. He says, wherever in an organization we have this spirit of cooperation, work, we have harmony. Look how these books are so align to the universal truth. So if our homes are lacking harmony, probably it's because we're lacking this use of cooperation. Cooperation means looking at the needs of others and collaborating constructively. Saying, oh, you're sweeping the floor? Let me help you. But how will I effectively help? By going there and doing the same and not change. Because some people, they think they're going to help and they start destroying the whole harmony. Like people coming to organizations and they think they're so wise, they're so much better. They start saying, oh, you know, I have a better idea. And when they entered, people were working in certain harmony. Now that they are in, they, they start giving these ideas after ideas, and this is not actual collaboration, constructive collaboration, true cooperation. We need this inner silence. Observe God. All the works silent. It's exactly what Divaldo taught me one day when we were talking about a woman who had a baby and... Uh, the mother came to see. And this woman came to me and said, Vanessa, and I was sharing with the father, saying, you know, I thought she was going to help, but you know, she keeps trying to do the things that I, the mom, want to do. She wants to hold the baby. She wants to feed the baby. But I said, Mom, I want you to do the other things because this is my part. <coughs> Cooperation means allow the other one to be the center of that relationship. That's humility. And Divaldo said, Vanessa, most people don't know how to be cooperative in silence. They have to give their opinion. They have to think that they know better. They have to think that they know a better way of doing stuff. And Mentor Joseph always says, if somebody comes and gives an idea, give them the task so they can fulfill it. Because once they fulfill it, 
then they're gonna prove they're really better. No wonder Emmanuel to Chico Xavier, to Chico Xavier. He got to know that the neighbor was stealing from the garden he put together. Emmanuel said, you know, give to the neighbor the task of watching this out. It stopped the whole thing. Instead of destroying it, cooperating with it. The garden is of somebody else. I'm not going to take anything, extract anything from it. I'm not going to destroy. It's constructive. To construct, we need to add. We need to join in. Surrender. Humility. The show is of somebody else. We enter it. There are many people who don't have, uh, you know, they don't know how to deal with kids because they think they have to lead and they don't know how to lead. But how about this humble exercise? Let them lead. And you observe. And you join them. They're going to tell you what you do. You don't need to do anything. It's a good exercise of humility because we often tend, like this man, I've got to know of this study on psychopathy and this neuroscientist found out that he had the brain of a psychopath he was making a study exactly on that and he started asking himself but how come my activity of my brain resembles so much I, I never killed anyone I never will I don't want to I have a family I love my family my family loves me and then he started funneling down through the traits of psychopathy and he said you know but deep inside I'm very competitive to the point that I don't allow my grandchildren to win any game I have to win always it, it's a psychopathic feature feature when you don't allow your grandchildren to win a game <laughs> it's true psychopathy of course it is we're joking but that's in his own words and then he wrote a book about it Hopefully, we'll get him to Kardec Radio one day and talk more about it. Because psychopathy is the, the other extreme of its opposite, altruism. Something we aim at achieving in our daily lives. Think more of the needs of others than ourselves. And then we can cooperate. Finally, he ends this chapter by saying, the person who helps others will help himself and will silently find that this is the most secure formula for readjustment in the evolutionary process. He ends the chapter about cooperation by telling us without charity there is no salvation. If you reincarnate, he's saying, imagine in the schools of regeneration, potentially when they're studying this, they're saying when you reincarnate, if you want to succeed, don't forget to help others because it's through that pathway that you're going to find the most secure, he says, formula for your readjustment, the reason why you're reincarnating. The last exercise we need to make for this day, proposal for this day that we're just opening, January 7th, 2017. Asking ourselves, how can I help cooperate more with people in my life? Cooperate meaning, let's learn what they need and do what they need, not what I think they need. Shall we do this as an exercise? Let's work on this because Emmanuel is sharing that this is the most secure formula for succeeding in a reincarnation and thus progressing to immortality. Thank you so much, dear friends. Any other questions? Yes, Sunshine, you're asking about collaboration and cooperation. Mm. According to Emmanuel here, he's using collaboration to define cooperation. And why is he using Spiritism as a science defines the words differently. He's using cooperation because it's like 
an operation together with somebody else. Collaboration means it, but cooperation only happens when this collaboration is constructive. So Spiritism is redefining for us the word cooperation and making a distinction because we can collaborate with others to destructive pathways or constructive ones. But when we cooperate, we're cooperating, construct, collaborating constructively. That's the new definition he's giving to us and we're going to absorb it as an opportunity to align ourselves in this reincarnation. This book, Thought in Life, is the guidelines, he says, for life when people are preparing for reincarnation. And they are so kind, they downloaded it through Chico Xavier, and here we are studying it and readjusting ourselves. Okay? Thank you, hello, Marcio Lee, and thank you, thank you, Tanya, thank you, everybody, for being together. From now on, we may potentially be doing this Facebook Live just to make it easy for everybody in the business of Carlos' work, taking care of Virginia, in our lives, we may potentially be doing this at 11 p.m. every day here at Facebook Kardec Radio, okay? Lots of joy and cooperation, January 7th, the day of cooperation.